how are people holding up? Weekends go all right as well as weekends go in a pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Right. Good, 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 good. Um, not too many uh, things going on in terms of announcements uh, today. I think we're just kind of trucking along. Um, I guess the only thing to keep in mind, uh, I think we'll have an SI session uh, this evening. Samantha, is that correct? Samantha out there? Looks like Samantha might not be out there. But uh, it's Monday, and Mondays are when we have SI sessions. Uh, so I'm guessing that's probably what's going to happen. So uh, Samantha will send out a, an announcement. Again, these are uh, good things to go through, jump into, uh, just to sort of make sure that you're on the ball with material. Uh, this stuff on conditioning uh, can get pretty tricky uh, until you get the, all the pieces and parts figured out. So uh, definitely go through and make sure that you've got that uh, uh, squared away um, and SI sessions can help out. Okay. Uh, any other questions about where we're at, where we're going, research, anything like that? Feeling good? Okay, cool. Uh, let me jump in here. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You went. You went mute, Cade. We were uh, working on a uh, classical conditioning. Okay. Last time, right. Yeah. All right. I I just wasn't able to catch the lecture at all. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, if you didn't wasn't able to catch lecture, um, it'll be uploaded. You just go through, uh, pull that down on YouTube, go through and pick that up. Cool. All right. So we had finished last time talking about uh, extinction, right? Uh, that once we uh, uh, get a classically conditioned association uh, set up, um, <clears throat> Uh, what we can do then is extinguish that uh, uh, that link uh, by again re repeatedly presenting that conditioned stimulus over and over and over again without presenting the uh, unconditioned stimulus. Uh, and in that case, remember, if we just ring the bell, 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 eventually the dog is going to stop salivating. But because of some different phenomena that we see, spontaneous recovery, reinstatement, renewal, uh, these things that we uh, see pop up in terms of behavior, we know that uh, extinction doesn't involve a scrubbing of that uh, classically conditioned association from uh, the organism. Uh, what we uh, know is that original or that uh, initial learning is still there. Uh, the extinction learning just covers up over the top of it. Uh, but what happens, particularly if we've got a pretty, particularly strong classically conditioned response, that response can force back up, it can pop back up and override that extinction learning. So just keeping that in mind. Okay. So classic example in psychology uh, of this classic conditioned approach, uh, research by John Watson demonstrating uh, that we could condition fear responses in humans. So up to this point, most of this work was being done in uh, animals and labs and, and sort of dogs and things like that. Uh, what uh, Watson did was demonstrate that uh, you could very easily, all these same uh, rules and things of, of classical conditioning uh, absolutely apply to humans. Can someone, does someone know the story of little Albert? Did, did, can anybody tell us what, what was going on with this research? when they scared the child with a white rat and like so they he saw a white rat and then he heard like a really loud noise and so every time he saw the white rat in particular he um like flinched and like freaked out yeah absolutely Jaden. you're exactly right so what watson did is they have uh sort of with a young child an infant called little albert this is sort of little little albert here and what they did is they uh, presented Little Albert with a white rat, right? And uh, in this scenario, Little Albert sees a white rat. Is he interested in the white rat? Sure. Is the white rat doing anything? No. And so there are white rats just there, right? But what they did is then they uh, went through and whenever they would present that white rat, 
This is an infant. He can't sort of know really what's going on. They come up behind and make a really loud noise, like clashing cymbals or something like that. And when you crash a loud noise, an unexpected noise in front of an infant, what does that infant do? You're going to cry, right? Um, so every time they would present this white rat, they would startle the infant. The infant would freak out, start crying. Uh, and then pretty soon, uh, what happens when we start presenting that white rat to that infant? What is, what is little Albert going to do? He's going to be scared. Absolutely. And so what we've done is we've established in a human being very quickly uh, a classically conditioned response. Okay. So what is, what is, what does the white rat start out as? Someone help me. Uh, yeah, I heard someone quite, uh, was that Jonathan? Yeah. Shout into your mic, man. And tell me, cause I think you're right. The neutral stimulus. Yes, that rat is the neutral stimulus. Okay. And what is the conditioned stimulus? Or excuse me, excuse me. Uh, what is the unconditioned stimulus in this uh, setup? The loud noise. Exactly. The loud noise. Okay. And what's the unconditioned response? Being startled. Being startled. Okay. So we've got this neutral rat, this rat doesn't mean anything to little Albert, right? Rats, I mean, it's there, but it doesn't contain any information. But what we do is we pair that rat, the neutral stimulus, with the loud noise, and that loud noise creates a, uh, a startle reaction, crying sort of emotional reaction in little Albert. Uh, but if we do that enough times, we probably don't have to do it too many times. At some point, we're going to present that white rat without the loud noise, and little Albert's going to start crying. At that moment, what is the white rat become? The conditioned stimulus. The conditioned stimulus, absolutely. And what's and what's the conditioned response then? Being startled. The yeah, the fear, the crying. Uh, specifically, when that fear and crying happens in the absence of the loud of the loud crash that's when we know we've conditioned that response. So the rat has gone from being a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. The startle and the crying has gone from an unconditioned uh, uh, response when it happens when we startle the child to a conditioned response when it happens in the presence of the rat. Okay. Um, and again, remember when you're trying to keep these terms together, uh, when you hear unconditioned, think unlearned automatic. Conditioned just means learned uh, response. Okay. And so what they found when they went through and did this, they found that uh, pretty soon, little Albert was not just responding to just the rat, right? What little Albert was doing is anytime you presented uh, him with a sort of some sort of white furry stimulus, he would have a reaction. He would get upset. So now, they, right? now he fears even Santa Claus, right? What do we call this? What is uh, in terms of classical conditioning? So we paired, we created classical conditioning, conditioned response to the rat, but now he's responding to white Santa beards and stuff like that. What do we call this? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what this is. is generalization response. I was uh, conditioned to react very specifically to white rats. But what this has done is I start to become reactive to anything that looks kind of like this white furry stimulus. We call that a generalization response. Okay. So uh, Watson's research, unethical to it by today's standards. We'll talk about a lot of research that we couldn't do today for obvious ethical reasons, uh, but started to uh, become and sort of demonstrate that uh, this could obviously be done in, in uh uh, classically conditioned responses do occur in, in human beings and they happen very quickly and easily in many cases. Um, and so these principles of, of associative learning, some of the most important theory and principles and uh, uh, processes uh, that help with our understanding of anxiety and then treatment for uh, anxiety. Um, this classical conditioning response, huge in determining sort of our understanding of things like phobia, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, there's other things that are going on with uh, these types of conditions beyond just a classical conditioning response, but that classical conditioning is still a big, big 
heavy piece of understanding why people's fears persist even in the absence of uh, sort of actual threat, danger, things along these lines. Okay. And would that reaction last um, through adulthood? Like his reaction to white rats, would it last his whole life or just as he started to grow up? Uh, okay, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things that uh, the lore of Little Albert, like what actually happened to Little Albert is sort of, I don't know. There's lots of stories out there. I don't know exactly what's correct. Now, from a developmental standpoint, um, I don't know. It would make sense if sort of this person or little Albert grew up to sort of be sort of maybe anxious around these things. Probably, I would think something like that might extinguish on its own, right? Um, we have bad stuff happen compared with stuff, and, and so we don't all aren't plagued with phobias all the time. So there's natural extinction that goes on. Um, but I mean, it's possible, you know, um, you know, and this was starts to be like sort of the core of like some psychoanalytic thinking, right? Like your trauma as a kid or things that happened that were sort of you didn't like or were uncomfortable in childhood plagues you on for the rest of your life. Um, it's possible, but I don't think it's necessarily, oh yeah, this kid will absolutely go forward and always be sort of reacting to sort of this type of stimuli, right? But you can see in kids who are exposed to neglect, abuse, and childhood trauma, right, right, left, and center, if I never know what's going to come out, startle me, scare me, harm me, that for me to be anxious and on edge and sort of hyperreactive uh, uh, to uh, stimuli that most people would say isn't a big deal, you can start to see how this uh, could very easily start to play into that. Um, other questions? All right, cool. So make sure that you go through, take a look at the lecture summary uh, slides, the comprehension check slides to make sure you have a handle on this stuff. Um, this will lock into place once you've kind of got the system down, but it's really, really tricky. Make sure that you're going through examples on your own uh, and let me know if you run into any difficulties. Okay. All right. Going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to transition into operant conditioning. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, at the beginning of the classical conditioning lecture that uh, this overarching uh, sort of area of associative learning uh, has two sort of primary mechanisms. We've got classical conditioning and we've got operant conditioning. Okay, Operant conditioning are situations where we see learning uh, where the probability of some volitional response increased or decreased based on some sort of consequence. Okay. And so what are we talking? Someone remind me, what are we talking about more? And we're talking about a volitional response. A voluntary, perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. Voluntary response. Okay. This is the thing that differentiates classical conditioning from uh, operant conditioning as far as when you're trying to figure out which which system am I going to use. Classical conditioning, this is automatic stuff, right? If I uh, just jump down and I ask uh, Lindsay here to just automatically startle yourself, like automatically startle and have a, like a genuine startle response where your heart rate increases and your breathing, right? <laughs> I like the, the effort there. But it's not something I can do because it's an automatic response, right? Um, uh, if I said, uh, Cade, immediately fill yourself with intense joy or intense fear or sadness, right? Like you can, you can kind of sort of get that going, but it's, it's a natural automatic response, right? So that's the stuff that we're talking about with classical conditioning. Operant conditioning, this is stuff that you are electing to do uh, just because you've decided to do it, okay? Um, seriously, I just scrolling through uh, your videos here, just trying to troll people. But uh, Brooke, raise your right hand. Okay, that was a volitional response. Brooke did that because I asked her to do that. These are the types of things that we start to see being learned with operant conditioning. So John Watson, primary figure in, op in classical conditioning. B.F. Skinner, uh, primary person associated with this uh, learning operant uh, conditioning that's associated with different types of consequences, okay? Uh, and operant conditioning based on what we uh, call Thorndike's law of effect, okay? Um, 
Law of effect says that any, fa any behavior followed by a favorable consequence will increase in frequency. Behavior followed by an unfavorable consequence will decrease in frequency. Okay? This seems pretty straightforward stuff, right? If I do something and whatever happens, and because of my behavior, something good happens, the likelihood of that behavior increase, uh, continuing increases, right? But if I do something, something bad happens, hopefully the likelihood of that behavior would decrease in the future based on that consequence, okay? Very simple, very straightforward on its face. But when we actually get into uh, sort of the mechanisms of behavioral training and things like that, things start to get a little bit tricky. But this law of effect is sort of the, the, the heart and soul of operant conditioning. So Skinner's original work, uh, a lot of this uh, using animals, rats, pigeons, a lot of experimental work within uh, the laboratory. And what we, uh, the device that Skinner would use in a lot of these, uh, 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 in these studies came to, be, came to become known as a Skinner box. I don't know that Skinner named it Skinner box. Other people I think named it Skinner box. But uh, so basically, we've just got to set up a, a chamber where an animal can receive reinforcements or punishers for specific behaviors and can go and watch through and uh, look at the impact. So here we've got a rat hanging out on uh, in a box. Uh, there's a little lever here. The rat can press the lever and receive a food pellet, right? We've got little light signals. Lights can go on and off. Uh, signaling sort of either food or a shock. We've got a speaker to go through and uh, send uh, auditory information into the, into the animal. And so what we would, uh, what Skinner would do in this early research is go through and set up various con uh, uh, various learning paradigms and conditioning schedules and watch the impact of behavior on these animals, right? And this is always the question uh, when we're doing these animal models. We say, oh, well, those are animals. Yeah, does that really generalize to people? In terms of behavioral principles, absolutely. Like we're not different. Like if I'm, it doesn't matter if I'm training rats or training children or sort of modifying behavior in adults, it's the same basic principles. You think, oh, well, we have free will and we can do what we want. Yeah, it's true. Um, but the impact of learning history is very, very, very strong. And it looks like it doesn't matter if we're talking about flatworms or uh, human beings. Looks like we all play by mostly the same rules. Okay. So when we're talking about some basic terms in uh, operant conditioning, first thing we need to get a handle on is this idea of reinforcers. Okay, A reinforcer is any event or stimulus that strengthens a target behavior. If I have it, and so the number one thing when we're working with these uh, with these uh, operant conditioning paradigms. Number one thing you always have to do, very, very first thing, is identify what is the target behavior, okay? And a target behavior is always something that you're doing, not something that you're not doing, right? Um, uh, if I'm sort of looking at Jacob and I'm sort of trying to train Jacob's behavior, not fooling around is not a target behavior, right? That's the absence of a behavior. If I want to set a target behavior that's sort of on that thing, I would say maybe uh, uh, attending to lecture or something like that, right? So it's easy to get yourself turned around and say, oh, what if? But remember that a target behavior is always uh, an organism doing something, not an organism not doing something, okay? So uh, if we've identified our target behavior, anything that strengthens that target behavior, anything that increases that target behavior or increases the likelihood of that target behavior is going to be a reinforcer. So a couple different ways we can use reinforcers. Okay. Um, we can have positive reinforcement paradigms. Okay. In a, in a positive reinforcement schedule, what we're doing is we've identified a target behavior and what we want to do is strengthen that behavior by presenting some sort of pleasurable or desirable outcome. Okay. Um, now, when we're talking about these reinforcement schedules, there's something else to uh, sort of write down in your notes and circle it seven times and highlight it. If I say positive, it just means that I am giving something. We'll get into negative. Negative means taking away. Okay. If you get into in your head that positive means good and negative means bad, 
that'll work like 80% of the time, but you're going to get yourself confused. Positive just means I'm giving something. Negative means I'm taking something away. So in a positive reinforcement schedule, I'm strengthening the response by presenting some stimulus that's generally pleasurable or desirable. Okay. Can someone give me an example of a positive reinforcement situation? Um, you give yourself like a treat after you've like completed like an hour of studying. Perfect. Yeah. Who, who said that? Because you're right on, uh, right on track. Oh, Viv. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you're exactly right. <clears throat> if you set up, and this is a great sort of way to self-train, right? If I say, I'm going to go through and I'm going to study for, let's say, half an hour. And if I do that, then I'm going to sort of give myself some sort of reward, right? What that does is that increases the likelihood of you continuing to go on because you've reinforced, you've set up a self-reinforcement schedule. What about anybody out in the audience who any done any animal trainings with dogs, horses, sort of some type of sort of uh, sort of animal training program? I know. Okay, Cody. Yeah, Cody. What what animals have you sort of worked with? Uh, horses, dogs, and rabbits. Okay, cool, cool. So a lot of behavioral principles. This is the core foundation of getting animals to acquire certain uh certain types of behaviors right if i'm trying to get my dog to sit right what do i do as soon as the dog sits i give him a treat dog says okay hey what's going on dog sits again give him another treat uh before too long what's going to happen that dog is going to start sitting because it's going to receive a treat target behavior is sitting giving the treat that's the reinforcer uh because it increases the likelihood of that uh of that uh event okay uh, other examples, allowance. Anybody get allowance growing up? Cade got allowance. Cade, Cade, Cade had nicer parents than me. I didn't get no allowance. They're like, hey, you live here for free. That's your allowance. <laughs> uh, but sort of the idea is like you have chores or some sort of things that you're going to do, right? And if you do those things, then you get paid. Increases the likelihood of doing your chores or sort of whatever uh, is going on. Um, praise right? Uh, going through and like if I'm working with a child and the child is doing something, staying on task or, or things along those lines, uh, uh, if I've got uh, some kid that I'm working with who's uh, sort of on task behavior, we were talking about uh, target behavior for Jacob is not not screwing around, it's sort of attending class. And so if, uh, uh, if Jacob is attending class, I say, oh, hey, nice work, really appreciate you doing that. That praise is reinforcing, okay? What about this, though? This is a tricky one. This is a tricky one. Let's say uh, we've got uh, a kid in, so you're at Walmart, when we used to go to Walmart or other stores and things like that, right? Let's say that you're in there and you see a kid in a checkout line throwing a fit, throwing a fit, throwing a fit, throwing a fit, right? Uh, and moms or dad, whoever's there with them, at their wit's end. And they say, okay, go ahead. Here's a candy bar because the kid, to get the kid to stop throwing a fit. What did that parent just do uh, to that fit throwing behavior? They encouraged it by rewarding him. Yep. They um, intentionally, but still yep. rewarded him. Yep. Functionally, exactly right. What I did is I just reinforced that behavior. What did I just do and almost certainly assure happens next time I'm in the checkout line? Kid's going to throw a fit right? Because last time I threw a fit, I got a candy bar, right? Um, and so if I'm a parent, I'm going to go with my wits in. I didn't mean to, but if we're uh, looking at the fit throwing and the target uh, as the target behavior, what I've done is I've reinforced that and increased the likelihood of that uh, continuing moving forward, okay? So people understand the positive reinforcement schedule, kind of how that works? Positive reinforcement is pretty straightforward. Everybody generally not, doesn't have a problem with uh, positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement, though, this is where people will start to get tripped up. But a very, very important principle in uh, operant conditioning. If I've got an organism on a negative reinforcement schedule, what I'm doing is I'm strengthening a response by removing some sort of typically 
aversive or unwanted experience, uh, stimulus. Okay. So again, this is a reinforcement schedule because I'm increasing the likelihood of a target event, but I'm increasing it by taking something away. Remember positive means giving negative means taking away. Okay. So, uh, in the best example I can give of a negative reinforcement schedule is going to be, all right. So, if anybody has sort of a, well, it's not even newer cars. Cars, when I was growing up, didn't have this, but they do now, right? You get in a car, start your car, have it, uh, don't have your seatbelt on. If you start to drive, what happens? What does your car start doing? Yeah. It starts to ding. Yeah. Starts to ding, starts to flash. I personally cannot handle that. It's a small thing, but it crawls under my skin. I cannot handle sort of that ding. You know, my dad has so it doesn't hear so well. I get in a truck with my dad and he starts driving around and like, he's just going, going, going. He doesn't have a seat. He doesn't hear it. I'm like, put your seatbelt on one to be safe. And then two, because you're driving me nuts with this. Uh, but as soon as you put that seatbelt on, what happens? It stops. it stops, right? So in this situation, this is the best one of the best uh, and most clearest examples of a negative reinforcement schedule that I can think of. What is the target behavior? Uh, if I'm if I'm a, a, a car company, what's the target behavior I'm trying to increase? Putting your seatbelt on. Putting your seatbelt on. Seatbelt wearing, right? And uh, Maya, in order to get you to wear your seatbelt, what I'm going to do is if you're not wearing your seatbelt. I'm just going to annoy the hell out of you with this not with this noise, right? But as soon as you engage in that behavior, that thing goes away, okay? And so over time, Maya, what do I do every time I get in my car automatically? You're going to put your seatbelt on. I put my seatbelt on. I don't even think about it at this point, right? And what this is is it's a very, very successful uh, application of negative reinforcement because what I do is I just put my seatbelt on now when I get in the car because I've been conditioned it does the, the 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 tone doesn't even have to come on anymore I'm just doing it automatically right and so what we've done is we've strengthened some response by taking away this sort of chime this dinging thing like that okay other examples that we see right um, I don't know so this is the you go the other way too, sort of guys uh, nag women, women nag men, I guess, parents nag kids, things along these lines, right? Um, but let's say, uh, like I'm hanging out at home, I sort of identified a sort of <laughs> a sexist gendered picture there I've put in my, uh, Jonathan likes that, he thinks that's funny. Um, and now it's on the internet, so fun. Um, anyway, uh, let's say that I'm at home, right? Uh, and I'm sort of teenager, right? And my mom or my dad is sort of saying, do your chores, 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 clean your room, clean your room. Eventually, I'm like, ah, enough, enough already. I'm going to go through, I'm going to do my stuff, right? Uh, and so once I start doing my stuff, the nagging stops, right? And so this, we can also think about this as a negative reinforcement schedule. Pretty soon, I'm just doing my chores just to sort of get sort of so that someone's not on my case, uh, constantly chirping at me with things, okay? Um uh another one all right um anybody have small brothers and sisters uh uh kids of your own cousins anything like that we're talking like small kids right infants uh lindsay if uh sort of a, a baby's crying or a baby needs if a baby needs help assistance something what does it start to do it cries <laughs> and and does it and sort of that crying will continue is it easy to ignore a crying baby no we're we're actually hardwired not to ignore crying children it's an aversive experience right but biologically this makes sense babies can't take care of themselves right so if i'm crying and i go feed the baby change the baby give the baby attention whatever it needs then hopefully it stops crying, right? And so what the baby has us on is a negative reinforcement schedule, okay? Another example, substance use, okay? Let's say I'm a heavy drinker. Let's say I'm a really, really, really heavy drinker, okay? I drink a lot, and I've got a problem with alcohol use, okay? What happens if I've been doing this long enough if I'm not drinking? 
let's say I'm like, okay, I need to cut back. I'm not going to drink. What happens to my body? It um, experiences withdrawals. Yeah, I get withdrawal it symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Is that pleasant? Nope, it sure isn't. Okay, what's the best way to get rid of a withdrawal symptom super fast? To drink. Start drinking again, right? And so if we think about uh, addiction processes and things like that, right? These are working on a negative reinforcement schedule. If we think about uh, the addiction as the one pulling the strings, right? Uh, and the target behavior is as drinking or using opiates or something along those like nicotine use, right? Um, anybody here smoke or dip? All right. If you, yeah, if you don't, what happens? You get grumpy. Yeah, you, you, you get Yeah, yeah, you, you, get, you get a little bit grumpy, right? You're sort of a little bit irritable. But if I go through and I, I, uh, I dip or I smoke or sort of whatever vape, now all of a sudden I'm feeling better, right? And so again, what this is is a negative reinforcement schedule. That use is reinforced. It's The likelihood is increased by these withdrawal symptoms. As long as you're doing it, we're good to go. If I take that away, I'm feeling not so great. Or if I don't, I'm not feeling so great. But as soon as I uh, go, that withdrawal, those withdrawal symptoms are pulled away. Okay. So all really, really great examples of this negative reinforcement. Again, just remember that negative just means taking something away. Positive means giving. Any situation where I'm increasing a target behavior is going to involve a reinforcement schedule. Okay. So couple of other things to think about reinforcers. Uh, primary reinforcer, this is any innately reinforcing stimulus, okay? Um, these are things that are going to, at their very core, because I'm a human being, are going to be intrinsically rewarding, okay? So examples here are going to be food, sort of, sort of treats or something like that, um, like in terms of like food treats, uh, chemical stimulation, um, is innately reinforcing uh, just because that makes my body feel good, right? If I'm not a cocaine user, but like I was in a lab in a Skinner box and someone gave me cocaine, like I would probably like my body would react as bodies react to cocaine. That's why people use it, right? Same thing with opiates. So sort of this type of chemical response, uh, praise, okay? Praise is a basic, like, again, we've talked about how humans are social creatures, right? People like to receive attention and praise. We Different people respond to it to different levels, but it's sort of one of those things that's innately reinforcing, okay? On the other hand, we have secondary reinforcers. Secondary reinforcers are things that increase behavior by association with a primary reinforcer, okay? Can someone give me an example of a secondary reinforcer? Michael, what would happen if I gave you a $100 bill? Me, Michael? Yeah. Uh, I'd be pretty happy, actually. You'd be pretty happy. Why are you happy? Because uh, I like money. You like money, right? What is money? It's monetary value I can use to exchange for goods and, serv goods and services. Okay, beautiful. Perfect. Exactly what I was hoping for. Does that, does that note mean anything? Right? Like if I give a hundred dollar bill to an infant, are they excited about it? No. No. I mean right. if they like the color green. Right, right, probably. maybe. Right. Yeah. Or if I go into the Amazon, right, and present sort of find some sort of indigenous folks uh in in the middle of the rainforest, give them an American hundred dollar bill. Does that mean anything? Not at all. Not at all, right? Money is a secondary reinforcer because the money itself has no value but it's associated with things that I could go through and buy, right? I can get things that make me happy. It sort of conveys status. Uh, if you walk around and say, hey, look at my $100 bill, like you'll, you'll get attention, right? So these are things that sort of a secondary, money would be a classic uh, uh, example of a secondary reinforcer. It in and of itself has no value, but what it conveys, what it means, it's sort of linked to primary reinforcers uh, because it's kind of a symbol, okay? Uh, someone else. Uh, Doctor? Yeah. Would an example be, say, like um, our soda credits, for example, we're doing the we're doing the 
studies and the secondary reinforcers that we get credit for them? Um, <clears throat> they really don't have much, they don't really have value to other people, but for the students in the class. Yeah, yeah. Sonal credits are a little bit tricky because like you're you're doing those because it's part of a course requirement. And so that you get that in order to pass the class. And so yeah, it's a secondary reinforcer. There's there's a number of steps in between. But Michael, you're on the right track. What 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 is it thinking about sort of class and education? What are secondary reinforcers that we use actually pretty heavily, maybe in, in younger kids? Exactly. That gold star has no value. Like there's, there's nothing about that gold star that is intrinsically reinforcing at all. But what does that gold star represent? It's supposed to, for them, it's supposed to represent good action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, 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 uh, it, it, it it's associated with, um, sort of attention, regard, status, right? Um, and so that gold star, stickers, things along these lines, hugely reinforcing for young kids because it's associated with attention. It means I've done something good that someone's recognizing me and that recognition is intrinsically uh, reinforcing for folks. Okay. So primary reinforcers, anything that's sort of innately reinforcing, secondary reinforcers, these are things that reinforce behavior because of association with some primary reinforcer. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we've got our uh, we've got our positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement schedules down. Um, but one of the things we do, and again, Cody, you probably re uh, realize this. If I'm trying to get, let's say, a horse to engage in some sort of what what, what types of things were you trying to uh, train horses to, or were you working to train horses to, or have you in the past? Them to wear saddles and stuff like that. Okay. Everything like that. Okay. Yeah. So this is good. So so it's starting to sort of sort of back up, right? Sort of follow. Sort of if sort of some pulls the reins, and sort of that means to back up. Sort of learning some of these reining uh, techniques and things like that, right? As we get into sort of more elaborate, sort of like trick riding and stuff like that, right? These horses are learning some pretty complicated actions, right? Do I start, if I want to uh, teach a horse to walk backwards and say lay down, right? Do I start right by back? All right, horse, walk backwards and lay down. That's the goal right now when we first start out. Not quite sure what you're yeah, well, probably what we would need to do is we would start small, right? By getting the horse to one, wear the bridle. Then two, to recognize that sort of the action of sort of pulling the head back means to go backwards. And then eventually we would go through and say, okay, so now you're walking backwards. Now I want you to sort of lay over and, and tip down if we're doing some sort of trick thing, right? Uh, same thing if I'm training a dog, right, to go through. You see uh, dog sporting stuff. It's like someone goes through, uh, throws a Frisbee, dog leaps out of the air, grabs it midair, and comes back, right? Um, if I want my dog to do that, do I start with, all right, uh, Rover, right, aim here is to jump in through the air, grab this disc out of the sky. No. What we need to do is we need to go through and uh, build up to that. So what we might start to do is have that dog first sort of run out after sort of a Frisbee or something like that. And if the dog runs out for the Frisbee, then we reinforce him, right? And so the dog's run out of the Frisbee, run out of the Frisbee. But pretty soon we sort of pull that reinforcement back until maybe the dog picks up the Frisbee in its mouth. Then we reinforce that, right? And then dog runs out, brings his, picks up Frisbee in the mouth, but he doesn't bring it back. So we're not hold, withholding reinforcement till he brings it back. Then we sort of reinforce that. Okay, so now we've got a fetch behavior that we've put together. This would be an example of shaping. And we would continue to do this until we've got that dog flying through the air, grabbing uh, Frisbees out of the air and bringing it back to us, right? It's a complex behavior, but we can't start out all at once. What we do is we do small things, small things, small things, small things, small things until we build up to something that's uh, sort of the behavior that we want. And this is a process known as shaping, okay? We can't bite off more than we can chew. If we've got a really complex, elaborate behavior, we got to take baby steps to get there, okay? Now, 
this is the point uh, in the lecture where if we were all together, what I would do is I would have one of you come up, right? And I would say, who's going to help me out? Uh, Maya, you're going to help me out. Cool. You're coming up and I'm like, uh, Maya, turn around and look at the rest of the class. So you turn around and I put this on the board and back. Like, All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have, uh, we're kind of trying to shape Maya to come up and sort of draw a circle on the blackboard. And then I would pull it down. You would turn around and I would say, All right, what I'm going to do is this thing. I don't know. Can you hear that? A snap. Okay. We say, This snap. My, my, this is the best thing you've ever heard in your life. Like this, you would do anything for that. Like that would just drive you just anything that you would do. You would knock down doors to hear this. Okay. We all agree that that's a reinforcing thing. All right. You just hang out and start behaving and sort of you do stuff and I'll sort of give you snaps when you sort of need to get snaps. Right. And so what would happen is then the thing would fail. Like you would sort of walk around for a while. Like it's only happened like like once or twice in the entire time that I've uh, uh, been doing this is someone's actually gone on the board and draw a circle. I started out with like a stick figure. That was way too complicated. It takes up a bunch of time in class and it's generally a failed experiment. But um, I don't think so. I think you would I think you would figure it out like right away after like three snaps. You'd be like, done and then and then it would be good. So I'm sad that we've missed this opportunity for success. But the idea is is it's hard, right? Because you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Like if I said, hey, go up and draw a circle on the board, then it's easy and fine, right? But if I'm trying to train a, a dog or a young child or something like that, and I can't verbalize my instructions, I can still train elaborate behaviors. I can't just communicate it to you verbally what I want you to do. And so what we need to do is we need to start. So as you start to get closer and closer to the, uh, to the blackboard, I'm going through and reinforcing and then sort of maybe you start to turn away from the blackboard. I stop, you turn back toward the blackboard, I snap. So you go up, you grab the chalk and then I'm sort of this and then sort of you're drawing a line and then I'm like, oh, and then you draw a circle and I'm like, hooray, that's where we, we sort of we were trying to do the whole time, right? Um, we can do it. It just takes a little bit more time and you have to be thoughtful in how you're doing it. Uh, but this shaping is a huge, huge piece of trying to uh, reinforce and condition these volitional behaviors, right? You didn't automatically reflexively go up and draw a circle on the board. It's something you were doing intentionally, but what we can get there uh, is through a series of successive reinforcements. Okay. So do people understand shaping kind of how we're supposed to be, how we're using this and, and sort of how this is used effectively in sort of the modification of behavior? Cool. All right. Other thing when we're shaping behaviors, right? Uh, there's a couple of different options that we can use in terms of our reinforcement schedule. Reinforcement schedule is any type of program or system that determines how often we're going to reward a target behavior. Okay. So remember when cl in cl uh, operant conditioning, we always first want to identify the target behavior. What are we wanting uh, to achieve here? Okay. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to determine how often or how frequently and sort of what type of system are we going to use to reinforce that behavior? Okay. So if I'm using a continuous reinforcement schedule, continuous reinforcement, reinforce a target behavior following every single occurrence. Okay. So every time, every time whoever I'm trying to train engages in that target behavior, they get a reinforcer. Okay. Um, so I'm teaching my dog to sit. Dog sits, I give it a treat. Dog sits, I give it a treat. Dog sits, I give it a treat. Every time that dog engages in that behavior, I'm going to reinforce it. I'm going to give it a treat. Okay. So uh, continuous reinforcement is pretty straightforward, right? And it's an important tool in our belt in that we can uh, get organisms to acquire a target behavior very, very quickly with a, a continuous reinforcement schedule. Okay. If I'm trying to teach my dog to sit, it's important that I don't reinforce it sometimes, otherwise that's going to be confusing, right? So to early on, I'm going to use this continuous reinforcement. So every single time I see that target behavior, I'm going to go through and uh, provide a reinforcer, okay? And what we see is interesting is the magnitude of uh, uh, the reward ends up being proportional to the magnitude of, of response. So let me go, Daniel. So uh, again, this is another uh, thing I like to do in, uh, 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 if we're all in person. Uh, is So I go through and I go up and I say, hey, Daniel, uh, make a strange noise for me, right? You make a strange noise for me. 
<laughs> okay, yes, that's perfect. I like that. And so then what I would do is I would pull a, a wad of bills out of my pocket and I would uh, give you a dollar for that. Okay. What would you do if I gave you a dollar for that? Do it again. You do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And I keep sort of as fast as you can do it. I'm going to keep paying you money right now. So maybe you're a little bit apprehensive and sort of like, oh, I'm sort of making a jerk of myself in front of everybody else in the, in the class and stuff like that. Right. But what if I started dropping twenties on you instead of ones? Okay. Yeah, super, super fast, right? And so what we see with this uh, continuous reinforcement schedule, rats in a cage, right? If I'm giving rats in a cage and there's sort of the target behavior is pushing the lever, okay? And I push the rat pushes the lever and it gets a food pellet. And it's like, oh, yeah, I like food pellets, right? So I'm going to keep doing that. But all of a sudden, instead of food pellets, I switch it over and start giving it a shot of cocaine. Cocaine is much more interesting and fun than food pellets. And what you see is that rat will very quickly start outside of the stimulant properties of the drug sort of doing this stuff. So we see that the magnitude of response proportional to the award, right? Uh, $1 versus $20 versus $100. Daniel give himself a heart attack doing making weird noises as fast as he can, right? Particularly if that just keeps coming, right? So continuous reinforcement, very, very good at developing and sort of generating and acquiring uh, some sort of target behavior, right? The drawbacks of continuous reinforcement is that target behavior starts to become extinguished very quickly if I sort of stop, okay? It's not practical for me to reward my dog every single time it sits, right? And that's not the point. Like I want my dog to sit if I say sit and I don't want to have to give it a, a, a reinforcer or a treat every single time right? If I'm in a classroom and I'm trying to uh, encourage on-task behavior uh, with a child, I want, don't want to have to give that child a sticker, a toy, or sort of whatever every single time, right? But uh, what we see is that uh, if we stick with a, a continuous reinforcement schedule, that behavior is, uh, target behavior is acquired very quickly, but it's also extinguished very quickly if I stop providing a reward, okay? Um, do I have any gamblers in the audience? Anybody likes to play slot machines? Cade, Cade is an ish. Okay. Cade, what if you went to a casino and you sat down at a slot machine and every time you put in a coin, every time you pulled, you won? I can see you put coins in it. You'd put, continue to put coins in it, right? And so very quickly, we would establish if the target behavior was uh, sort of playing. If you're winning every time you pull, we're going to establish that behavior very quickly, right? But so you're winning, 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 winning. All of a sudden, machine stops paying out. It's never going to pay out again, right? How quickly, if you've been reinforced every single time, how long are you going to continue to play that machine if it just stops paying out? It's pretty much going to stop right away. Yeah. Okay. This is done. I'm sort of cashed out. I'm finished. Right. And so this is the problem with continuous reinforcement. Very easy to acquire a, a, a target response, an important sort of tool. But if we maintain it, it's going to, uh, those behaviors are going to stop very quickly in the absence of reinforcement. Okay. So what we do is we have intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement is a variable reinforcement of some desired behavior. So my target behavior uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to reward it every single time, but I'm going to put together a schedule where sometimes the behavior is rewarded. Sometimes that behavior isn't rewarded. Okay. And there are different ways of, uh, setting this up. Um, <clears throat> two different parameters you want to keep in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in your mind here, fixed versus variable. Fixed means the same thing every single time. Variable means sort of different across sort of different times. Okay. And then we've got ratio uh, versus interval. Ratio, uh, we've got reinforcement based on a specific number of responses. Okay. So if I've got a fixed ratio schedule, what I'm doing is I'm providing reinforcement after a specified number of responses. So let's go back to that rat in that Skinner box. Okay. And let's say the target behavior is pushing this lever. Okay. If I'm on a continuous reinforcement, uh, reinforcement schedule, every time the rat pushes that lever, they're going to get a pellet. 
push the lever, get a pellet, push the lever, get a pellet, push the lever, get a pellet. If I go through and I switch that, transition that rat over to a fixed ratio, a fixed ratio schedule, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to reinforce that rat after every five lever presses. So rat presses the lever, nothing happens. 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 Fifth press, reinforced. Okay, and so then the rat presses the lever again. Nothing, 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 reinforced. So if I keep this rat on a fixed ratio schedule, every fifth bar press, they're going to get a reward. Okay. So the reinforcement is based on the number of uh, responses. If the rat doesn't press the bar, the rat doesn't get anything, right? Uh, but every fifth time the rat presses the bar, it's going to get a pellet. That's the same for always and forever with this schedule. Okay? This is different than a variable ratio schedule. Again, we're still going to reinforce based on the number of bar presses. It's just we don't know the number of bar presses uh, that we uh, the rat needs to make before it gets reinforced is completely random. Okay, so maybe on the first shot out it presses one, two, three, four, five, gets a reinforcer. Next time goes through one, two, gets a reinforcer. Next time one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, gets a reinforcer. Next time maybe it's twenty presses. After that it's four. So we got a still we've still got a ratio schedule where the organism is being uh, reinforced based on the number of responses. It's just with the variable schedule as opposed to fixed. It's every five variable just means it's at random. We don't know how many times I have to go through and and press that bar in order to get reinforced. Okay. Um. So that hits us in terms of time. We can uh, stop there. Again, uh, folks, if you need to split for other stuff, you can go through. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, but if not, if you sort of have questions about some of this stuff, uh, sort of fire away. Um, I have a question on primary versus secondary reinforcers. Yeah. So when you were talking about chemical stimulation for primary reinforcers, uh -huh. um, would drugs be the secondary reinforcer like cocaine or would that just be primary and like cocaine is not secondary yeah so cocaine like the substance right the chemical stimulation like that's that's the that's the primary reinforcer now the that's the substance that then creates the the chemical stimulation but yeah so we wouldn't tease that apart so the cocaine itself would be the primary reinforcer but the thing that starts to become difficult right uh uh substance use behaviors heavily heavily influenced by uh some classical conditioning and and some sort of uh operant con some associative uh conditioning processes but they're not the only thing right we know that people drink use substances for a lot of other reasons right um it's sort of working with if you've had anybody in your life or yourself gone through uh some difficulties like you see some pretty extreme behavior where if you're standing from the outside, you're like, why are you continuing to do this? You've lost your job. You've lost family. Like there's clear impairment. Like why is this persisting? Well, part of it is sort of chemical stimulation withdrawals and stuff like that, right? But there's also a lot of secondary reinforcement that goes on uh, with substance use, right? My substance use, yeah, I get high, but I'm also, it's also associated with acceptance. Um, it's associated with uh, a French, uh, maybe a, a friend group or a sort of a community or a subculture. Um, it can be associated with sort of perceptions of, of safety. If I'm using this substance to uh, sort of avoid negative emotion states or things along these lines, right? So there's a lot of secondary reinforcers that can come sort of contextually within that. But if we're thinking about uh, Zoe, uh, like the, the substance itself, we would think about that as a, as a is a primary reinforcer. So anything, so when we're thinking about primary reinforcers, think about things that are intrinsically psychologically or uh, 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 physiologically pleasurable. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. No problem. I'm uh, sorry. Just, just so I'm clear. Yeah. Cocaine itself would be the primary reinforcer. Effect would be secondary reinforcer. No, so the, the, the cocaine, so yeah, and again, don't don't overthink this too much. 
Um, the cocaine itself is the primary reinforcer. It's the chemical stimulation. I mean, it's the chemical that's the primary enforcer. If I give anyone that chemical, they're going to, their body's going to respond, right? Now, uh, the secondary reinforcer could be sort of if I struggle with cocaine use, right? Um, there are maybe secondary reinforcers that sort of go through and sort of this is associated with acceptance and sort of things sort of in sort of settings and, and stuff like that that can help maintain that. So it's not just straight uh, withdrawal symptoms and things, but for the purposes, and, but if that, and that gets in a whole sort of clinical area, sort of drugs and behavior and stuff like that. For our purposes, Jonathan, just think about chemical stimulation. I mean, when we're thinking about primary reinforcers, we're talking about praise, um, food, um, chemical stimulation, sexual stimulation, like things that are intrinsically rewarding as humans for our body. Did I freeze up? I froze up there, right? Okay. D did, did you catch that? No. Okay. So when you're thinking about uh, uh, primary reinforcers, think food, um, physical stimulation, sexual stimulation, praise, um, chemical stuff, like things that are intrinsically rewarding to our bodies. That's, that's what we need to be thinking about in terms of primary reinforcers. Other questions? Feeling good about this? I do have one. Problem. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Michael. I'm just a, based on intermittent reinforcement, you know, for to reach the desired behavior, there still has to be a reinforcement to begin with. Uh -huh. and it's kind of, uh, as we said, the reinforcement is provided after a specified number or after an unknown number. Uh -huh. Does the reinfor does the reinforcement have to be? How do I say? Does it first have to happen at a specific pace and then it can happen randomly or at fixed time? Fixed time is that something you can change? Yeah, yeah. And this is what starts to get really, really interesting with uh, behavior modification, the application of these principles, right? Um, is we can start to play around. And so what we'll get into the in next week is looking at the effects that different reinforcement schedules, uh, different schedules of intermittent reinforcement have on behavior, the patterns of behavior and intensity of behavior, changes depending on what type of schedule that we're using. Okay. Um, and so if I was, and this is where people will often try and make attempts to sort of sort of train animals or do the, and it, and they're not so successful. So you can screw it up. Right. So probably uh, if I'm trying to get uh, so, a person or sort of some sort of organism, some sort of target to acquire a behavior um, that uh, oftentimes some sort of continuous or pretty consistent reinforcement is going to be important on sort of picking that behavior up. Okay. Um, but then what we'll probably do is maybe switch over to an intermittent re once, once, once uh, the organism is kind of on schedule and kind of has it figured out, then what we can do is switch over maybe to a uh, intermittent reinforcement schedule where, uh, where we're not reinforcing every time, but on some sort of uh, sort of interval schedule or something like that. You don't really you don't really create the schedule with intermittent reinforcement. That's so more something you switch to. It depends, right? Like so, because and this is where things start to get uh, tricky. If we think about gambling behavior, okay. Cade said sometimes he likes to play the slots, maybe, right? Um, so probably what didn't happen is like Kay didn't go to school or have someone from the casino come sit down through and say, hey, every time you pull this slot, you're going to win. And then he's winning constantly for a while. And then like, oh, I'm going to phase you off to a uh, to an intermittent reinforcement schedule. Right. Uh, this is where we get into uh, um, uh, uh, observed uh, learning and stuff like that. Right. We're surrounded by information and things like that. And so I might go to the casino and I'm hearing bells and whistles and things like that, right? And so sort of back, oh, everybody's winning, everybody's winning. So then I sit down, and I'm already starting on a uh, uh, on a um, on a variable ratio schedule. Okay, you think about slot machine. Great example of variable ratio. I'm being reinforced by the number of pulls. I just don't know how many pulls that I need to pull in order to get reinforced. Right? Sometimes it could be 300. 
and then I get uh, hit a jackpot or I win, and then the next three on the next on the following third pull I win again, right? I don't know. It's sort of all jumping around, but it's based on the number of pulls, right? So there in that situation, we're thinking about casinos. I'm starting right out on uh, on a variable ratio schedule, but there's observational learning that's gone on just from being around sort of knowing what the situation is and stuff like that that's already got me persisting on this before but let's say that you were trying to teach your say teach your dog to sit right um, probably the best case scenario if you want that dog to acquire that behavior very quickly is to provide continuous reinforcement sort of over and over and over and over and over again until they acquire that behavior and then phase it over to a, a an, an intermittent reinforcement schedule yeah other questions all right cool um you folks are rock stars thanks for hanging in there um get on this stuff early uh again go through and i uh you already know what questions are going to look like on quiz four right like you've been through this like you know what i'm going to be asking you right so make sure that you're going through examples and things like that and playing around and if you get an example you're not sure it fits just let me know i'll help you sort out what's what on that stuff okay all right folks uh we'll see you later uh and yeah let me know if you run any snacks Bye.